Yeah, so our, our next presenter is John Noel, and um, I've known him for a long time through the ADMB project, and he's been working on it for a while. So um, he's going to be telling us uh, about that project, uh, some of the hosting issues, and uh, the next steps. Uh, okay, so um, I'm, I'm John Echet again, and I, I, I'm the, by default, I'm the lead programmer for ADMB. Okay, so um, let's see. So let's go through the, the timeline here. So um, auto research was um, uh, first started in 1989 and they, um, you know, David Fournier, and he started developing um, a thing called um, Autodiff, okay? So Autodiff started in 1990 and that, that coexisted with the, the Borland 1.0 compiler, okay? So once, um, uh, once he was able to have the compiler, he was able to start developing um, Autodiff. Okay. And then in 1994, um, while working with um, another researcher, he started getting this um, twinkle in his eyes about how to, de how to develop it, um, how to avoid doing the low level stuff with ADMB, um, how to do the low level stuff with Autodiff. And that was the beginning of ADMB. And here we go, and then we have, then the random effects with Hans Ska came in 2002, and then eventually it became open source in 2007. And and a little bit, little bit more um, info on me. In night, um, before before it became auto research, um, I was taking this course at um, the University of Hawaii. My background is really mathematics, and I. My career goal was actually to be an actuary. And then I started taking the scientific programming course. And my first language that I learned was Fortran. And that was the career change for me. And I decided, ah, this is what I want to do. I want to program. Okay. Okay. And this, this right here, this is where in 1990, this is the first board that ADMB was built on. I and mean, you got to you got to look at this is this is where ADMB started. Small little processor right there, you know, like my god, what is it now? Maybe maybe 500k of memory on that board. But this is this is this is the hardware that where ADMB started on. Okay. Ah, uh, before I, it's it's one of the most CPU expansion boards. Uh, uh, it gave John some, John Seibert some grief while he was trying to work with this thing, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and by the way, um, the ADB Foundation is um, now called the AD Foundation. So, um, and we're, the, the, the goal there is to get um, as many projects with AD, that's doing AD, involved with our project. Okay. Okay, so ADB project. Okay, so, uh, the main, the main objective for our, our project is mainly to continue the maintenance and development of ADMB as an open source project. And you know, we, all, all of this stuff here, and one of the, the core problems with ADMB when, when Dave Forney was doing it was, if you get a new compiler, if you get a new compiler and you wanted, you wanted ADMB to work with a new compiler, you would first email Dave, you know, Dave would finally get to it like a month later, but, um, and, and then, you know, he would, he would, he would, he would complain and then, but eventually he would, he would do it, but it would take a, a while to do. But with their project here, we, 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 we try to maintain this with standards as much as possible. We stay, we stay with the current C++ standards. We develop the new features and um, we fix issues and we, we ensure that the users are easily, can easily build, install and maintain the software. And that includes a make file. Text. Okay. So a lot of people here talk about version control. You got to have version control. You got to have version control. I will slam it home. Why? Okay. So in 1997, um, in, two, in 2017, um, Andres came in. We had this, we had a ADMB workshop and then Andres came in and he says, John, there's something wrong with the code. There's something wrong. It, it doesn't look like that it looks like this and this is the likelihood profile and said ah it's, it's a user issue it's not my issue it's a user issue <laughs> so okay so we looked through the code and and no it turned out that 
it wasn't. So we found out that the code worked in, 2011, um, in version 11.1 and 11.2. So what we had to do, because we had version control, we were able to track down the commit that first had the error. And that is about 1,800 commits that we went through in one day, in one day. But, you know, it, it didn't look as pretty as this. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, it, it was like, but we finally got it, okay? And we found the commit, okay? And the nice thing about version control is you can blame the guy who did it. You can blame the bastard that did it. <laughs> So I, I, I'll, I'll kind of explain that. Well, I'll, I'll go why, why that, there was an error there, but I'll, I'll explain it a little bit long, um, later on. And the second reason you do it, the second reason why you need version control is, um, I remember I worked my first job with John Seibert, I think. We, we, well, actually, that's my second um, software job. But we used to do things differently. We didn't have version control. There was no such thing as version control. We had CVS. And that was hard to use. So we, we did everything on a directory structure. You know, with version one directory, version two directory, version three directory, version two directory, JCA for me, version five directory, JRS. And you know, stuff was, stuff worked, stuff worked. And you know, but it was kind of hard to merge and it, it, and sometimes you get, you open up so many windows and you're, you're, you're you know, you, you do things that you don't expect and then, you know, shit like this happens. If, if you guys recognize this, then you know what I'm talking about. This is not a good thing. Job security, no. <laughs> but um, this is the reason you need version control. Your code should be always safe. You got to think of version control as that safety deposit box. And that is... It may, not, it, may not it may not be you that do, does it, it'll be somebody else that'll do that to your code and then you'll lose everything. I didn't do this. There's two programmers and I, I, didn't, I didn't do this. Okay, you, 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 you figure that out, okay? Okay, so the, the next thing with, um, when, when you do this, when you do version control, you need, you need you should treat the master branch as the release branch. So, you know, you got to expect that most people will be always downloading your stuff or always pulling your stuff. And if, they, if you're developing on the master branch there and they pull your stuff, they pull it over and they can't compile it, you know what's the next thing that will happen? You'll get tons of email. Why can't my, why, why doesn't this shit work? You know I mean? I mean, my stuff work. And, and, <laughs> And that's that's the reason for it. So what what we what we do for our project is we now create um, a, a development branch. We call it dev. We don't call it develop. We call it dev, and we do all of our stuff within that dev. And then once we can figure out that it works, and we we um, we verify that the answers are reproducible from the previous version, then we'll move merge it onto the master branch. But but you know I mean, our main development is on that development branch. And that's, that's the way we handle our branching here. And this, this is a great way. And then, you know, the URL is there. You can, you can get more information on that. Okay, so um, infrastructure. This is boring. I, I, you know, it's just, it's just services that exist on the cloud, but I'm, I'm expected to um, talk about it. But in, yeah, here, here it is. Here it is. So um, we have... Um, we use GitHub a lot, and we use GitHub to do the version control, of course, which we must have. And we also use it to do the website. And the, the beauty of that is, you know, we have one account, and you can use it for both the website and, uh, and the GitHub. And there's, there's, no, there's no separate account for WordPress. There's no separate account. You know, I mean, you just, you just do the editing on one, in, in one, one area, okay? Um, NCs, who, who helped us start the, the ADMB projects is still, is, 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 is supporting our mailing list and, and, and um, let's see, we have Bluehost and they have um, some of our other sites. And 
the, the nice, the thing you guys got to look at here is these, oops, uh, right here is the automated bills. Automation is key in an open source project because you don't want to even push a button. You want, you want the button to push itself and that's what automation will do for you. And so we have, we have a couple of sources. Um, we use, you know, Travis and then this Microsoft Azure and, and you know, those, those kind of, I guess they work, you know, not bad. Okay. Um, so GitHub pages is, is the one that we use for our website. And, you know, we, we've done, we've lot, we tried a lot of stuff. You know, we tried Plone, we tried WordPress, uh, we've done it um, statically. And this is the one that is the easiest of the, the, of the, all the options. And it's, it's pretty much just a markdown page. And, you know, you take, you know, you get stuff like that there and you can, you know, it's like HTML, it's like markdown, HTML. And for people that code like me, man, this is awesome. I can code inside of my HTML file. Okay, and that stuff there gets processed, um, used in GitHub and, you know, comes like this. Hmm, nice. That's R. I stole that off of R, okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, um, now we, we have a, a, a kind of framework that we use for um, developing um, ADMB. And, and, and these, this, you know, we have tests, we have the scripts, and we have, of course, we have the source code, and we have examples in the script, and that's the way we organize everything here. The contrib is where we put most of the, is where we can, you know, external users can extend the, the ADMB, they can old, add their stuff to it, um, they can, Contribute is where we can do it. And we have a nice framework for doing that. Um, and there's a readme file that can, that'll, that'll show you how to do it. Uh, okay. Okay, now testing. There's, there's two types of testing that we do. We do a full run testing where you rattle, where you, where you check the, um, where you get the output and you can check the results of the output. And we also run unit tests, okay? Unit tests are, is what, what it is, is it's just testing smaller parts of the code here. And, you know, for example, what is the expected value of init B here? It's, um, init B would be 0 0.5. Uh, if I ran this code on the four time, what would I get here? What you're typing is. Say I don't type. No, you would, you would get zero. And that's why people don't use Fortran anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is correct. Because, because, because Fortran, it starts with an I. Well, that's what I said, if you type. Yeah, but I said if, if it wasn't type. And, oh. <laughs> and, and the, reason, the reason I say this is because I, during, my, during that scientific programming course, I, I, I programmed the, the probability distribution and for, you know, God, I kept getting zeros. I kept getting zeros and that was the reason. Yeah, right. I, implicit yeah well, you know, I, I, I moved on from Fortran. <laughs> I coded in something better. Okay, so the, the, the unit test here, um, uh, geez, I can't read. So it, it just uses to, you know, test for individual development. And it's good if you do like the test driven development, if you, that's the kind of mode you do. And, um, and the, the one that we use here is, is what's called Google test. And, and this, is, this is an example of what it, what, it, what it looks like here. So all of these, so if you, if you can see here, what I'm gonna try to do here is, I'm trying to uh, test out a, a um, God, it's hard to see here. I'm trying to test out um, threading in ADMB on, a, on, a, on the gradient structure here. So it goes through a couple of these asserts and then it'll flag the, it'll flag, it won't exit the program, it will just flag it if there's something that goes wrong and it'll keep track of it. And, and this is, this is what, it, what it comes down to. So, that, you know, I mean, ADMB right now has almost, almost close to, um, what is it? 
almost almost 900 tests that it does does and this is just the unit testing and it, it you know does other the full testing as well where it tests the runs and examples and make sure that the answers that you get is reproducible it, it, that has the same results as the previous answer and unit tests are really great because it, it'll it'll spot the answer i mean spot errors uh, problems um, early on before the release okay and also okay so the next thing here we we have um, a set of tools that we use here, and I, I guess this is the, the infrastructure here. And our, our toolbox is um, was really actually my toolbox, and you know the debugger, the debugger. I I cannot stress the debugger. You you, you need the debugger, and you know we use profilers, and then we use um, static analysis tools, and of course we do the um, uh, the deoxygen and 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 the code cover. So it's every everything stuff there, but people are recommending. Okay, and remember when I, when I mentioned that one problem, why I made that change, why it caused that error in the beginning? This was the, this is the, the tool. So apparently it flagged one of, the, one of those functions and it didn't like that the parameter was unused. So I fixed it. Well, I thought I did. And then uh, apparently that's, that, that fixed um, cause the, um, the profiler to mess up. But it, it's a nice tool though, but um, you know, you, did, you just take a look at the, what, what they complain about and if it's, um, you just have to be li really careful about the, using these static analysis tools because it's, it's not always, it may not always work um, what they're recommending to fix. Okay, and then here we do the oxygen and um, I, yeah, it just, it looks nice. That was done by John Seibert, by the way. Okay, now, the critical thing, automation. You gotta have this in your code. You, you wanna even avoid the push button. You just want the code to do it, push by itself. So, um, there's a couple of um, automation services. There's Travis, there's Microsoft Azure, and then there's the BuildBot. Um, I like, the billbot. In fact, we will go back and redo the billbot again, because the problem with the other twos is you have time limits. Like Travis, there you, you cannot do runs exceeding like thirty or forty minutes. After thirty or forty minutes, it, it times out and you get an error. And you know you you can you are more you have more flexibility with using the billbot, and it's it's it's. And to do, to do releases, you have to do it with the billbot. Just, the, the other two, I, I, I think you can do it, but I, 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 can't, I can't understand the instructions, so I, I kind of give it up. Okay, and so this is, this is what it looks like here. So the user, happy, happy guy, fixes the code, commits it to the GitHub, the billbot checks the GitHub, I mean the, the version control, and then sends it off to um, servers on the cloud. And then the, the nice thing, what it does is, once it's done, it'll upload the file. So here, here is the, um, the Oxygen um, website here. So it'll just dump all of the files from the Oxygen directly here. So on the fly, without even doing anything, it does it for you. There's no push button, it just does it. Pushes itself. And the same for the up upload files here. All the releases, all the snapshots get automatically released. So if you have, if you have a bug fix, fix it, it uploads it, you send them the link to where the, the files are on the, the billbot on this one here, and they'll be able to retrieve and test it for you automatically. That is, that is, that is cool. Well, at least for me it is. Okay. Uh, so the billbot runs on very, it, it's a very memory because you have to use a lot of virtual servers and, and because you're running a lot of, um, um, you're running a lot of code, uh, uh, executables, it, it takes, a, the resources that I use is pretty high. You see that right there? That's a bad thing because that's, that, that, that signals server errors, which is hardware errors which means this machine is done. 
So we lost, we lost our second machine um, just past month. And the, you know, this, this machine is kind of good. It's been in service for about like over, like more than 10 plus years. But um, it's, 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 it's done, it's done. So there's, um, the problem with that is we ran all of our, the builds on this machine. So now we, it's, it's kind of hard for us to do the build. So I have to figure out another alternative where to, where to, where to store the, um, the, the virtual servers. Okay. And um, so what I did was I just installed it on the Zero Cloud. And just to give you an idea what it looks like here, yeah. Um, it goes through it, it does, it does, when, when the billbot signals the, the thing, it sends the instructions to the, the workers, and then it, it, it runs to the set of um, instructions. So it does, you know, it does the git, it does the make, and then it, it, it does the, the testing. All done for you without, without, um, without pushing a button. And, and, you know, this is Travis, you know, it, it does the same thing. And there's some nice things that it does in Travis, like it automatically runs the code coverage for you here. And you notice the, the red dot there. Eh, there's no error. It's just the dumb thing that timed out. Okay, so the, the next steps. Okay, so, okay, so this, this is what's, this is our roadmap, I guess. And um, so when, when we get back, when I get back to Hawaii, I find a place to, you know, send a place to install the billbot and get that back up and running. Um, and then we continue coding and then uh, look into some uh, uh, data flow and then plan the next workshop. Okay. Okay. So about uh, like two months ago, I, I went to, um, I went to one of these workshops that Paul Wessel was having, and he, he's the guy that runs, you know, he developed and uh, created the uh, you know, GMT tool. And, and it's, it's very similar. I mean, the two projects are very similar. Um, you know, they're, they're using Travis, they're, they're, they're developing what's called a, a succession plan, which means that Paul Wessel was thinking about retiring and they're, they're looking for funding, um, uh, continued funding, but very similar. And this is, this is the guy that I continue to talk to about um, how to deal with, open, uh, how, to, how, to, how to manage open source because he's, he's, he's done it. He's, he's done, been doing it for a long time. Okay. Oh, and, and, and here, finally, we, we are planning an auto differentiation workshop in 2020. And this is, um, this will happen in Copenhagen, Denmark. And, um, and you know, some of these stuff that we outlined there or stuff that I kind of thought we were going to add in. And one of the interesting things that we're going to talk about, try to do is to prepare a ADMB and TMB, um, a tool for, to go from ADMB to TMB. And that's, that's one of the tools that we will kind of take a look at. I think that's the more interesting thing because a lot of people have TPL files. Nobody wants to convert them. Nobody wants to spend the time to convert them. So what, what we think we can do is we can, we can make it so that the user doesn't have to change the TPL file. It'll just link directly to the right libraries. And I, I think we've kind of mapped it out and it's, this is just version 1.0. I mean, version, so it's, it's Anders thinks it's wrong. I don't know, I don't know. But we'll, that's, that's what our plan is. And hopefully we can, we can work on that and we'll um, think about it during the, the next workshop, yeah. Okay, and, um, okay, and then thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, John Noel. We, we have um, some time for questions. Any questions? Um, so John, uh, yes. so you mentioned it very briefly, but there's um, something called the contra libraries, which are basically functions that people have put together and, and um, contributed to yeah. the ADME yeah. project. And so those functions are not um, changing the underlying no, TMB no. code. No, no. They're just yeah. adding um, functions on and, and are fairly independent of the project, but they can be integrated into the project a bit like um, people writing R libraries, which yes. basically they don't 
change the underlying structure of R, but they they allow extension of it through independent packages. Yes. Um, can you go into a bit about your experience with people writing those and what what any issues that might have come up that needed to be solved? No, it's just it, um, um, it's been a while since somebody contributed, but it's 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 pretty pretty straightforward. So the 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 let me see if I can go back to that. Um, Uh, I don't know why I remember. Okay, but um, so the the source contains the the core ADMB and um, the and, and it, what it um. Um, I I can't answer. I I I just know that it works. It works really well. Yeah, we we it's just mapped out, and the experiences that we had with people contributing were pretty straightforward. Yeah. It, it just compiled. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Yeah. okay, another thing that I'd like to mention and maybe you can comment on too is basically the difficulty that everybody had actually contributing to the underlying source code. And um, part of it was because there's some languages that are used like the translator and things like that with some archaic like said or something, I don't know what it is, one of those. Yeah. Group. And so it was very difficult for people to get in. And also, um, I guess the, the underlying C++ code wasn't yeah. uh, documented very well. Yeah. And, and it was difficult to go back and document that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you tried Doxygen, but yeah. that only yeah. works if you actually program the comment. I mean, you code the comments in the model anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dave, for, Dave, program I wrote this code and you know I mean gosh he's like 1990 so you know I mean it, it there's there's parts of it that are messy I mean it, it's not the most cleanest of code I mean even even Matthew doesn't like that I mean there was kludges he wrote on kludges and it, I, I, I remember reviewing some of the code and I always came across some parts. I, I always knew the parts where Dave would have the most hardest time was it would contain a lot of four letter words in it, you know, I mean, in the descriptions and you, you knew that's, you know, he, he, you knew that's what the part where you had. But I, I think most of the, most of the problems with ADMB is it's, it's, it's like GMT where nobody can figure out the underlying, um, it's, it's that black box that nobody can figure out what's inside of it. And what we hope to accomplish during this next, um, during the workshop is, is finally, um, that I think needs to get done already is I, I know it, how it goes in the, in, in, in my, in my head, but, um, oops, but we, we just have to develop and show up what the data flow is. And I think we, we need to map that out. And I think that'll help people to figure out what, how, how to, how to code in ADMD once they figure out what the data flow is. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what we're going to work on. Just code, code it. Code. I mapped out, map out how the tables are set up. Yeah. I think one thing that would be very useful for maintainability would be to remove unused code because there's a lot of dead code in the, in the code. Base. I did that once. You did. I did that once and then I broke somebody's code. So I've never done that before. I never, I, I, I won't do it. Yeah. Well, it's hard to, you know, you, 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 you have code and I, 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 we, it profiler tells me it's unused. So I remove it and I broke John, you know, John Seibert's code. And then you know, he wasn't very happy about it. So from then on, we just always left the code in. Yeah. I think that's what makes it hard to read. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. But um, I don't want to break anybody's code. And, and also the, the underlying autodiff code is used by multi-fan CL and by AD model boards. So yes. I, and maybe John Seibert uses it directly too. So yeah. if it's unused by AD model board, it doesn't necessarily mean it might be unused yeah, by yeah. somebody else. Yeah. Well, we don't, we don't, the, the project's goal is not to break anybody's code is to um, uh, make sure that the code is, the code that you have is reproducible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.